Well, good evening. I want to welcome all of you who are viewing on this evening to our, my first virtual town hall as uh, mayor to the general public. Um, I had one last week with small businesses, but to the general population tonight, we're kicking it off with our seniors. And my name is Joe Curtitoni. I have the honor and the privilege of being the mayor of this great city. Um, I've never been more proud to represent the city in this time of crisis to stand by with all of you as we all pitch in to do our part to overcome really an unprecedented health emergency. Um, I am joined tonight um, by Cindy Hickey, uh, Director of the Council on Aging here in the city, Doug Kress, the director, uh, Executive Director of um, Health and Human Services, Adriana Fernandez, the Community Engagement Specialist in the Office of Immigrant uh, Affairs, and Carrie McSwain is our American Sign Language Interpreter, and we're so grateful to have her here this evening. Tonight's uh, town hall is being broadcast live, uh, and it also will be recorded for those who want to tune in later. So I'm going to go to a presentation about where we're at today and this unprecedented time, this time of uncertainty. But first, before I go through this, I wanna thank all of you and everyone in Somerville for helping us come together, helping us fight against the COVID-19 crisis. We're only gonna overcome this if we're working together. Uh, we're only gonna overcome this if we look out for one another. And I trust me, we will overcome this. And when we get to the other side of this thing, we'll start to rebuild our community, our economy, but our first and foremost priority is your health, your safety, and that of every one of our neighbors, our friends, and the people we work with. So I'm gonna kick this off right now and get going and, and give you a little snapshot of where we are um, today in Somerville. Uh, so this graph in front of you uh, tells you a couple of things. First, uh, these numbers on the left, uh, 712, 420, and 17 have changed. As of this evening, we have officially 716 uh, confirmed cases of people who have been tested positive in Somerville. And of those who have been tested positive, um, 451 now, that number's higher, have recovered. And sadly, we have now have 19 uh, fatalities. 19 beloved people of our community who've succumbed uh, to this really horrible, insidious disease. Now, uh, as I go through this number, I want to just remind people, confirmed cases or positive cases uh, don't actually tell you exactly who is carrying the virus or all the people that may be ill. This is what we know. And the trends here, uh, and this chart here, I'll explain to you, the orange bars that go vertical, these bars here are the number of new cases uh, here in the city. All right, and you can see uh, where they're trending. They started back in February uh, and they, they started to peak up and now they're starting to come down the new cases and we're testing more, more than we were back there but certainly want to be testing more. Uh, the blue line here is the total number of cases for the city. So again, total number of cases were over 700 and the new cases as it relates to the total hopefully will stay on a significant uh, downward trend. Again, but it's important to remember this, we don't know exactly who's carrying the virus, which is why we'll talk about the need for increased testing, uh, but it's important we have this information. It does give us some guidance. Now, how's this relate uh, to what's going on in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts uh, as a whole? Um, well, in Massachusetts, we have um, almost 79,000 confirmed cases. Uh, and here, similarly, the blue bars that go vertically talk about the new cases uh, day by day, by each day. And this blue line, uh, this darker line, is the total number of cases by day. So more than 78,000. And, you know, and this tells you on a daily basis how many cases are being reported positive. And sadly, in Massachusetts, and we're one of the highest in terms of confirmed cases, but more than 5,000 people, more than 5,100 souls have been lost uh, to uh, COVID-19. Now, um, I have to be honest with you, in all my years as being mayor, and you're mayor in this city, we've taken on many challenges. We've planned for many great things. We've had many crises. 
to have to prepare and respond to. But never ending like this, I don't know of any mayor who had a pandemic response plan in their top draw. But what I'm proud of, and I want you to be proud of, is the workforce in this community, whether they work in my office, uh, whether they're mid-management staff, or, or they're an analyst, or they're working out to deliver essential services the city have delivered. Uh, we came together as we saw trends around the world and the country emerging and the COVID-19 uh, epidemic spreading to a pandemic. And we developed with international consultants our emergency operations uh, response team and plan and our emergency operations response center. So this chart is just a simple way of seeing what we've done. We've prepared the EOC, the Emergency Operations Center, and from this, we work together. We have staff in many different departments doing things they don't typically do on a day-to-day -day basis, but you know, when you're dealing with the unprecedented crisis like the COVID-19 health emergency, everyone has to come together to do above and beyond, to work outside their comfort zone, to one, respond to this public health crisis in a very strategic way, so we work daily on interventions, on responses, on plans, on ideas to attack the crisis, to protect our constituency. And at the same time, we are working uh, on delivering your basic services. And on top of that, and I'm proud of is so many around the Commonwealth and the country are looking to some of all as how we set the standard to be nimble, be quick, be decisive and show leadership and come together to take on a challenge. And so we've been coordinating and working with our regional partners, cities and towns around metropolitan Boston, around the Commonwealth and different agencies at the state and federal level. And we'll talk about that. We've also been engaged and had the consultation and advice of some of the uh, foremost and well-respected experts, epidemiologists, health experts, scientists to help some of all and help us guide us in our decision-making process and that we fully understand uh, from our community what is occurring uh, with, the, with the pandemic, what are the best measures we need to implement to keep our community safe. What I want to mention along with that, there are really four main areas that we're focused on when we think about how we're going to respond and how should we respond as a community uh, around public health, Obviously, how do we support our residents? How do we sustain and add, give stability to our local economy so that it's prepared that when we get to the other side of this emergency, they're ready to go off and running? And also, certainly our city and our school services. But you know, our public health strategy is pretty simple and it's uh, pretty uh, straightforward. Uh, we, are, we wanna implement measures to interrupt the transmission of this virus from one person to another. That has been important and that has worked for some of them and working together with our regional partners, following our lead, you see that working across the region in the Commonwealth. The major concern is this virus is about to hit us, if you recall, was the surge. A major increase in the number of cases and people sick, overwhelming our hospital system and repeating a nightmare scenario that we've seen in other countries the best example would be Italy, where really moral decisions and life and death decisions on who should be treated, who should receive a ventilator or ICU bed uh, were being made in the hallways and really the best hospital system in Europe, in Italy. And we all came together, hands on deck, and made sure that we implemented measures to control the spread and the transmission of the virus to maintain the stability of our healthcare system. And that's been working. Um, also, our focus has been on widespread testing. Now this is available to all uh, residents and free for all residents, regardless of whether or not you have a primary care physician or health insurance or whatever your, doc, your immigration status is. All you have to do is call 617-665-2928 to make an appointment for the Cambridge Health Alliance and we'll direct you how you can get tested. Again, you don't even have to have symptoms. Our focus is also around contact tracing and recovery support for those people who are tested and do test positive, uh, and also making sure that those who test positive are connected to all the resources they need. So if you're tested positive and you're living with other people in your apartment or your family, we want to direct you to a place to stay where you can be isolated. And this is in partnership with our regional partners, so there's not a spread of the virus in your household. Um, also, 
to make sure that those in your family unit or yourself are receiving all the essential support you need, food, uh, healthcare counseling, and other supplies. Uh, and I mentioned the safe isolation piece as well. So um, supporting our residents takes many different facets. There are a lot of important points when we think about supporting our residents. It's uh, around food access, and we'll have, I'll have a little bit more detail on the next slide, but that'll be one example I want to talk about. You know, how do we help people protect themselves with, uh, with masks? How do we utilize our 311 constituent service line to make sure you have all the up-to-date information and all your questions can be answered? I'm really proud that so many volunteers in the community um, have pitched in to help take resident health and social service calls. And we've been offering support and referring to other staff as needed. Uh, how do we support uh, one another uh, through other benefits, uh, such as uh, unemployment cash benefits, SNAP, and so forth. You know, interdepartment, multilingual team of dozens of city and school employees and volunteers have been helping all our residents uh, connect to resources and apply online and fill out forms, all the red tape we have to get through to make sure you're connected to all the essential services and resources you need. Um, some call us, uh, there are others we reach out to. And our school liaisons, for example, have been making about 1,500 calls to families for weeks. Cindy Hickey and her team call, make about 100 to 200 phone calls to our seniors across the city on a daily basis to check in on them. This is all occurring in our efforts to attempt to make sure you're safe you're in a good status in terms of your health and you are addressing all your essential needs. Um, we're also focused on housing assistance for renters and homeowners. We understand, you know, as our economy came to a complete halt, people have lost their jobs. We have a record level of unemployment, the likes that we have not seen in this country since the Great Depression. Um, and without paychecks, people have been concerned that they will lose their apartment, they may be evicted. Uh, one, we cannot let that happen. People need shelter. Housing is a human right. Secondly, we certainly can have, not have people without shelter, which would exacerbate the spread and accelerate the spread of the virus from one person to others and put us in even a greater, uh, on this crisis at an even greater level and really put in jeopardy our healthcare system. And that's a scenario where we're willing to, uh, we had to put all resources to us to avoid. So we've been advocating, working with one another passing measures here locally that nobody could physically evict anyone out of their home or even their small business. We've been working with our state partners, our state delegation, delegation and other advocates to help uh, the eviction moratoriums and mortgage forbearance laws in the Commonwealth uh, that were passed. We're excited and grateful for all their leadership on that. Uh, we've also making sure we've been working with all of you who've reached out to us and say, how can I help to establish the Summerville Kids Fund? Uh, and I mean, we're so grateful for that. And that has been so inspiring. People saying, I, might not have much, but I can donate five, 10 or $20 to those who are in really dire need. And there are so many people in dire need. And so far, uh, we've had um, you know, over $100,000 raised, but we also had more than 700 applications. So we know the demand is the, what we have available, but so grateful for all of you who continue to pitch in and those who have offered assistance. Uh, obviously around senior services, uh, they're running multiple efforts. Uh, Cindy's team uh, for mask and food distribution to. Uh, social service uh, support for all our seniors. And we're really concerned about all of you and all our seniors in this community because you are more susceptible to um, be infected with this virus. And once infected, our seniors uh, have a difficult time overcoming uh, this illness. No one really knows how this virus or this disease acts, but it has a more negative impact on those who are underlying medical conditions and seniors. And who are more vulnerable and others in our vulnerable populations are more susceptible to uh, be infected by the disease. And uh, really a focus around uh, new immigrants, uh, immigrants in this community who in many, case, in many cases don't have a primary care physician, don't have health care insurance, uh, work in the essential jobs, are out there on the front lines and many services that support us every day and putting themselves at risk and their families. So we're doing extensive outreach to them to make sure they have connection to services and resources. They have access to testing as well. Um, so that just gives you a little bit of breath of what we're doing. But I want to just dive into one example uh, that I outlined just a second ago, and that's ensuring food access. Uh, access to food, food security now is really an alarming uh, need, not just in Somerville, but in Communities like Somerville around the metropolitan Boston region, like Revere, Everett, Chelsea, Lynn, Malda, but even your more affluent suburbs, I will tell you, like Swampscott and others, I've heard even the governor's hometown, 
there are seniors and others in need who can't go get food for some underlying condition or reason, or just don't have the resources to do it. And uh, making sure people are fed and safe and have all the resources to be sheltered at home, especially on more vulnerable population like seniors, is critically important. To give you an idea about what some of us have been doing, teaming together, when you combine the grab and go meals uh, that we distributed to our schools, uh, we're averaging uh, you know, almost 4,500 meals per week. When you combine that with what we're distributing outside of, with our food pantries, uh, we're talking more than 46,000 pounds of groceries and food have been distributed and, uh, and, on pro and weekly, you know, more than, you know, again, 4,400 meals and 2,600 people pick up uh, food or groceries from those resources. And this doesn't even include what the Council on, a Council on, Council on Aging delivers uh, to our seniors as they deliver groceries and food to all of those in need. And I have to commend Cindy and her team um, Doug Crest and his team, uh, Mary Skipper in the school department, and all the volunteers who pitched in to make sure our community is safe and has all the resources they need to shelter in place and, and take care of themselves. Um, we're also working hard, as I mentioned earlier, um, to help a local economy. Uh, you've heard the unemployment numbers and they're not getting any better. What's different, and people will refer to, well, we have some recent experience a few years ago, the Great Recession between 2008 and 2010. Well, there is a bit of a difference. There is a distinctive difference between that financial crisis and the one associated with this health emergency. This is driven by a health emergency. So the conditions now are much more unpredictable. During the financial crisis, driven by a collapse of the financing and banking industry, uh, the economy slowed to a very low level. Here, it's come to a complete halt. And what's really come to a complete halt here at the local level are all those main street businesses, small art galleries, the retail shops that we love and are so particular to some of them, all the eclectic mix of local restaurants, bakeries, cafes, and establishments that really speak to our diversity, our originality, our creativity, but also uh, uh, the foundation of our local economy. Uh, and what's really scary is, and I'll take restaurants as an example, uh, nationally, it is predicted that anywhere from 20 to 30% of restaurants will never open again because their business has come to a complete halt because it is very difficult to run an establishment in that industry. And you just can't flick a, button, flick a switch and start it all over again. And in addition to that, when we think of the new normal, we'll talk about that shortly, that we have to live with as a society, no one really knows how that's going to affect many of these small businesses. So we've been working and engaging them every day with our economic development division, providing them information and connecting them to resources. We've been trying to understand and inform them of best practices to run their business in their particular sector, whether it's retail or restaurant. We've been connecting them and giving them advice how to apply for different grants to support them during this time and help stabilize their operations so that they're survived through this crisis and are ready to be up and running when we get to the other side of it. I've had, we've held business town halls. I hosted one the other day. We've also established a $1 million summable business fund, which are really unforgivable loans or grants to locally owned and operated or local franchise owners in Somerville, uh, again, up to $10,000, which will help them, again, remain stable, survive this crisis, pay some employees, and in many cases, like restaurants, and now that bars and restaurants can uh, deliver groceries, help us with our food distribution challenges and food chain challenges. And again, we're working with them and the Commonwealth to aid and support and understand how they operate and function in the new normal and what some of the safe reopening strategies will be or should be. So I'm going to hand off this part of the presentation. And again, when we get through all the slides, uh, I'm going to answer questions. We have some questions submitted online, but this time I'm going to recognize the Director of Health and Human Services. Uh, and, he, and him and his team have done an incredible job, and their work is being recognized across the Commonwealth and region by Doug Crest. Doug? Thank you, Mayor. I appreciate uh, the introduction, and I also want to just thank you for your leadership in this as well. Um, I think we all realize uh, how special it is to have a leader uh, like you being able to be at the helms of all of this in a very unprecedented time. So thank you again. Again, I'm Doug Kress. I'm Director of Health and Human Services. Um, and 
I am going to just kind of go over a few things that we've been doing here. If we could go to the next slide. Thank you. So I really wanted to kind of focus in on some things that, that we have in place here. Um, I want to remind us that we still have a stay at home um, order, order in front of us. Uh, we want people to stay at home as much as possible. We do know that people over 65 um, and those who are living in nursing home long-term care facilities are really at high risk for severe illness, especially with the COVID-19. Um, we know that many of them are having those underlying health conditions and they are putting themselves even more at risk whenever they do become infected with this virus. Um, this is a very, very um, communicable disease and a virus that does spread fairly easily. And that's why we really put a lot of these things into place. So those that we want to continue to think about is how often we can wash our hands. And we need to do that frequently and often. You know, when we first started with this whole pandemic, we really were out emphasizing the idea of washing your hands, making sure you wash it for 20 seconds um, with warm, uh, warm water and soap so that we can make sure we get those viruses off us. We also look at the idea of how do we avoid getting close contact with others. That's a six foot distance. We now are calling that social distancing. And those are the things that we really want to look at and really continue to emphasize. So we also want to think about other things that we can do within our own households. And let's think about how do we clean our houses and making sure that we are cleaning the areas that are touched very frequently um, and all those surfaces so that those are wiped off. Now, we also have a, a new order that's out there about covering your mouth and nose. And that's with a face covering of some sort. Some people are wearing masks, other people are taking a bandana and using that um, as, as a face covering as well. So we know that there are a variety of options that are out there for us. Lastly, when we also think about this and we think about any germs that we're, we're, uh, we want to avoid spreading, we want to make sure that we're covering our nose uh, and our mouth when we're coughing and sneezing. Ideally, you can uh, cough or sneeze into a tissue and then throw that tissue away and wash your hands after you're done with that. Or if you don't have one in front of you, make sure you sneeze into your sleeve. Um, it's an important thing to think about. We always hear about this for our younger, our younger population who are learning a lot of these lessons now in our schools. Now, the whole idea that we did and we put a lot of those in, things into place is because we want to make sure that we are going to be prepared and we were prepared for a surge. And that surge is making sure that we're not overwhelming our hospitals in times whenever it, uh, we talk about related areas. So that's why we want to make sure that we do that. However, we still want to make sure if you need to go to the hospital, if you need medical attention, please seek that as soon as possible, because that's still a very, very important thing to do. Our hospitals are not closed and they still will take care of sick patients. If you do need to go to, to uh, handle something that's non-COVID related, please make sure that you are uh, calling your physicians, calling your primary care provider, as well as going to the doctor whenever you need to do that. And at times go to the emergency room. So we need to continue to do this. I think what's important is that we are doing this as a community. Um, this isn't just one person or two people. There's a whole community out there doing this work. And I have a great group of dedicated staff within the Health and Human Services Department from our Shape Up Summerfield group who are doing the food access program and doing an amazing job with a lot of that. To Cindy Hickey, who I know many of you don't need uh, a great inter an introduction for her, but I cannot say, what a champion she is for, for our senior population. And the work that she does is absolutely amazing. I'm able to call on her at any time and she always is there to answer my calls, answer the question and provide services to our community. And it's with great honor I get to now introduce Cindy Hickey, our Executive Director of Council on Aging. Cindy, do you want to take it from here? Thank you, Doug. And I do also want to thank Mayor Joe Crittatoni for being an outstanding mayor. We're so lucky in a time of crisis. I've been through many things with Mayor Joe over the last two decades. And I'll tell you, there's never been a better time to have such a great mayor as we have right now. But talking about the Council on Aging, um, I just want to talk about some of the things that we're doing. We are fully operational. The staff is working around the clock. The social work team is still doing 100% of uh, applications for 
food stamps, for health insurance, for social security. Um, we have a food stamp kiosk in our office. We're able to go in and access that. So we're here to call to make sure your needs are met. And that is with everybody. Um, we have our expansion of our friendly phone caller program, which has been, um, as the mayor said, very successful. We're calling about a um, hundred people a day and the friendly phone caller program with community people. I think we have over 25 community people that are making calls as well. And we have buddied up the seniors together to make sure that we're checking on one another. You know, you always hear in, in the winter time or in the summer in the extreme heat or the cold uh, to check on your neighbors. Well, this is another time that I know the mayor has asked for us to check on our neighbors and there's nobody better to check on than an elder neighbor living next to you. So this friendly phone call program has been extremely successful. We're also starting another program and it's called Cards and Notes for Seniors. And we're asking the community to please send us an, a little note. You can drop it off at 167 Holland Street or a card just to tell somebody you're thinking about them. And what we're gonna do is take these cards and notes and get them to shut-ins and medically, um, patients or clients rather that are home that cannot go out for any reason because of medical reasons. And we have encouraged them to stay home, but they're missing that personal touch. And we thought this would be a great way for the community to reach out to our elders. And we're looking for a thousand cards and notes. So if you feel like it, take two minutes just to write a note, drop it off, and we'll make sure it gets to somebody very special. We've also expanded our social media. We're having great responses back. I can't tell you the phone calls. Um, they're loving the Google group is getting all the trivia questions and um, the comments every day. And uh, we're on emails and um, our Facebook has taken a lot of wonderful comments as well. So we're really glad about that. Living Your Life newsletter, um, that's as well as, as it actually in addition to our regular newsletter that we put out. One is informational and the Live Your Life Well newsletter has been really something upbeat and positive. And you know, we just want to make sure that everybody is having a bright spot in their day. And we're hoping that that happens. We have um, on TV now and on YouTube, we're doing our musical therapy program. Um, this is for our memory cafe clients who have some memory issues. It's really been a successful program when we're in our Council on Aging buildings. Well, now we're bringing it to you. We had so many people saying how much they missed it. So we wanted to make sure that we put that on um, our TV station and also um, on YouTube so that everybody can enjoy it. And it's been great to hear from the family members. They appreciate the support. Music is such a great way to put a smile on your face. So we're really happy to be doing that. And for most of you who know, um, our physical fitness program is outstanding. Every week there's a new physical activity. Um, we also have been working with um, our yoga instructor, so she's there doing stuff. And we've been working also um, with a, some counselors, working on some counseling, as, long as, as well as our social workers have been doing some one-on-one -on -one counseling. We also have our brown bag program. Last month, we were happy to say we delivered over 200 homes in the past month um, getting receiving these bags. We're happy to help out anybody that calls. We were uh, making sure that we had um, essentials and, you know, somebody even needed a little bit of milk and we were able to run out and do that for them. But we also want to make sure that we had enough uh, food to go around for everybody. We had had a wonderful food drive from the Rotary, a summer Rotary Club, and that service so many people. The community has been amazing to the seniors and we just want to tell them and reach out and say thank you so much. We're going to continue with our brown bag program. It is extremely successful. The mass delivery program, we've already given, it says 4,000, but we have given out over 5,000. Uh, we'll be giving out over 30,000 by the time we're done, reaching out to everybody, housing buildings. And we delivered to housing buildings first because we felt that was the most eerie that was together and clustered. And we felt like that was the way for us to be able to help originally stopped the spread to make sure those who were closest to one another had a tough time social distancing to make sure that they had it. And now we're working on the community. 
If you have not had the opportunity to get a mask from the Council on Aging, we're running a very successful drive-through program. It takes about 30 seconds. You're going to drive up to 160. 167 Holland Street. You're going to pull in the driveway, tell us your name and address. We check you off and your masks are ready to go and you go on your way. So we hope that um, you're able to feel free to call us. Um, if you want to set up a time for us to, to come by for the mask, you can reach us at 617-625-6600 extension 2300. That's answered by a live person and we also you can call 311 and they'll connect you to us as well we want to thank you all for your staying at home be safe don't go out if you have to and you certainly can call us for anything that you need and adriana you're going to take it from here sure thank you so i am adriana fernandez and i work for the office of immigrant affairs and I'm very happy that we can collaborate with Council on Aging. Some of these services that uh, Cindy just presented have been provided to a group of about 60 immigrant seniors. Most of them are Brazilians, but we have also Spanish and Chinese speakers in the group having access to this wonderful program. So thank you very much, Cindy and all the team, because we've been um, able to provide the brown bag uh, with the help of your wonderful uh, social workers, like for the last two months, and all the volunteers, some some seniors, they, they've been like volunteering also in Cambridge Health Alliance, they provided some volunteers and masks, so thank you very much. Thanks, Adriana. So folks, now we get the opportunity to engage you even more with some question and answer. Uh, you're gonna have to bear with me because usually when I do these town halls or virtual meetings, sometimes the 250 cities and towns, there's staff running it for me, but I said I'm gonna do it and they challenged me that I, they, they bet I couldn't do it effectively. So if you have a question and some of you submitted questions, I am gonna go back and forth from the questions that were submitted ahead of time. And those tonight, you can submit that question in the question and answer chat or press star nine on your phone. Um, okay, but as Remind, I just want to remind everyone, don't forget to sign up for phone texts and alerts from some of LMA.gov and stay up to date on the city's uh, website and the link is there and apply uh, or donate for the Summer of Cares Fund if you want to make a donation or you need help or resources and there's more contact for you for community testing and the Council on Aging. So let's go right to the q and I'm going to stop sharing uh, on my screen and we'll all be here to answer it. So um, first is a question um, about reopening. And this question is from Nicole Trent. Uh, and I'm gonna read it off. Nicole asks, as the state of Massachusetts and the city of Somerville begin to have a phased approach to get back to normal operations, will there be any accommodations or restrictions for older employees with underlying conditions still working to protect them from being exposed to the COVID-19 virus? First, Nicole, uh, thanks for the question, and Doug, you can chime in afterwards. As it relates to the city of Somerville's operations and all the departments and city and schools, uh, the short answer is yes, uh, in terms of accommodations. Uh, we haven't fully um, analyzed and designed what those accommodations will be. Uh, I will say in short, and I, we hear this all the time, there's a new normal, and we don't know what that is. Uh, what life is going to bring us and how we're going to have to interact with one another. You know, how long are we going to wear a face covering? Social distancing rules will certainly be in place for a while. We know that when the governor does announce uh, uh, his first of four phases of reopening, with every industry and with every activity, public and private sector, there are going to be a new set of safety guidelines that we must all follow. Uh, in some of all, though, and I'm sure we're also advising seniors in general, and we'll talk about it. There's another question. This, is still to be very cautious and avoid being having contact with others if you can and stay isolated for as long as possible. This virus is not going away. We're going to live with it for a few years or until there's a vaccine uh, or a cure and nothing is forthcoming. But while that's happening, as we ramp up our city operations, we certainly don't want the senior members of our workforce or those with some other underlying or chronic condition uh, to catch the virus and become um, seriously ill. So more to come on that as we figure it out. But thank you for that question. Doug, did you want to um, respond to that at all? 
Sure. Let me just add a couple of points. I think the mayor really did a nice job of, of really laying out what we're doing here within the city itself. And I, I think that we also have to look at the way the governor is now also putting some other uh, rules and regulations in. This is a new normal and we're going to come out of this in a new normal. And I think that there are going to be a lot of different ways of, of how we're going to be doing business that we have to take into account when we're talking about a virus like this, because as the mayor said, this is going to be around for a few more years until we have a vaccine. Um, we always have to be uh, aware and very, very aware of the spread of this virus. It is a new virus and we're learning new things about this virus every single day. So I think that's part of the the reason why we need to make sure that we are taking and looking at those precautions uh, to move us forward so whenever we are all back together again we're able to do it in a safe way. Thanks Doug. Uh, this next message is from uh, Chris uh, Lindgren. Chris thank you for your uh, question and I'm going to read it out. Thank you for your leadership and teamwork on this pandemic. Can you provide more detail on the exact type of test that is being offered to residents, how it is performed, explain what it finds in the body and why that is important. Thank you. So I'll start and I'm sure Doug Kress will chime in. The uh, PVR test or the viral test is the most common one where they use the swab. That's the most common test um, to um, see cultures and determine whether or not you, are, you have the virus. That's the test that being uh, instituted by any of your healthcare providers or a mobile site up at some well, that anybody in the community can go get if you call and make an appointment. Um, and, I'm, and, and then the other test is being piloted is the antibody, antibody or serology testing. I'm gonna explain this in a way that, in the most common sense way that an, ex, an expert explained to me last night, and I had almost the same question. The, we need to expand testing in general because it's important for us to know not only who's sick, but how the disease is spreading or changing. We have failed at this effort nationally. Yeah. And in the state of Massachusetts, we have a long way to go to catch up. Somerville has adopted a very unique framework to expand testing to everyone in the community, even if you're asymptomatic. At the beginning of all this, and up until now, and still primarily, we've been testing those with the most acute or worst symptoms. Um, now it's expanding in Somerville and other places to those, even if you don't have symptoms. But the antibody test of the PVR really is important for the individual to know if you're sick and to, to seek treatment. Uh, the, this, that's his PVR test, excuse me, the viral test. The antibody test or the serology test determines whether or not you've been exposed to the virus. Now, the one thing about it, and uh, be cautious, people will have made the assumption, and I've heard even Dr. Fauci talk about this, that you may, you're automatically immune. It's still not clear as to the level of immunity any one of us would have if we've been exposed and, we, and they have found antibodies in us. There's still a long way to go. It was assumed there's some level of immunity. There's a lot of unknown. But the antibody testing is important, as well as the viral testing, but not on their own. Uh, for us to stem the spread of this disease, for us to reopen safely, we have to have enough testing of our populations so that as we see things changing, and I want to remind people, as we've said, it's going to be with us for a while, this disease. And we're coming off the surge, it's coming down, but there are gonna be other waves. These are called surges, I mean, post-surges. And the resurgence, the net part two, cannot become worse than part one or else more people will become sick, more people will die, it'll put more strain on our healthcare system and our economy will go further into deeper depths than it is now, if you can believe it. So individually, the viral test is important to know if we have it, if we need to seek treatment, how to respond to that. And the antibody serology testing is important to understand how or how much the community has been exposed to it and what we need to do to contain it. And, but that also has to be con combined with the Commonwealth's other efforts around contact tracing, like we're doing in Somerville, and case tracking. Doug, did you want, I know I answered a very long way to the answer, but do you want to add to that? No, I, I, I'll just answer, answer a couple of, or add a little bit more onto that. I think there's a couple of things to keep in mind for the antibody testing, and, and I know you uh, referenced this as, we don't know what that means if you do have the antibodies. You know, you may have some immunities. We don't know how long that may last um, or what happens if the, if the virus may uh, mutate just a little bit into the future, as most of them often do. So I think those are the things to keep, um, uh, keep in mind. The other thing I believe that they were asking is, why are we doing both of them or why should I do both of them? And I think the mayor did a great job of explaining there's two different areas. 
if you do have that virus inside of you, you should know, we want you to know about that. Keep in mind that a lot of people who do have this virus are asymptomatic, and yet they can still spread the virus. That's why it's important if you know it, it, to know if you do have that virus inside of you, so you can quarantine yourself and or isolate yourself and, and not spread that virus along. So I think those are the important reasons of why we're doing this. With that, um, I'll hand it back over to the mayor to the next question. Folks, I just want to remind you, you don't have to submit the question. You can submit the question on the, on the Q&A function on the bottom of your screen, or, uh, or you can uh, raise your hands or press star nine if you want, uh, want to speak. So I'm going to go back to one of our submitted questions before the meeting from George regarding accessibility. Are you currently working with supermarkets in Somerville to set up optional outdoor curbside pickup of food items? I feel comfortable about entering a supermarket and would feel safer if I could pre-order limited items and pick them up outside the building. George, thank you for your question. It's another excellent question. The short answer, this is one of the many things we're analyzing as we think about how we're gonna to continue to move forward and live with this disease amongst us uh, and this crisis. And as we think about opening up um, sectors of our economy, even though supermarkets are there, but also as we continue to think about the efforts or methods we have to institute to prevent transmission of the virus from one person to another. So more to come on this, George. Thank you for your question. Uh, next question is um, uh, for an anonymous attendee. And it is, I, I don't know if I have the answer to this, but someone might. What is the most effective disinfectant spray for surfaces and what stores carry it? I don't know a direct answer. Doug, Cindy, does anyone know? Cindy, do you want to take that? It looked like you were already bouncing out of your chair, but I can certainly add to it as well. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Okay, so there's a lot of disinfectants that are out there. So you can simply look at the labels themselves and see which ones say it kills the, uh, the coronavirus. There's a lot of different coronaviruses that are out there, but that's what you want to look for. Um, so there's a variety of brands that you can get out there um, that do say that. I would stay away from some of them that may be a little, that do not have um, any alcohol-based contents and things like that in it. I would also suggest that if you do are talking about surfaces and it's a hard surface that you don't have to worry about staining or anything, keep in mind that a bleach solution also works very well. And it's a third a cup of bleach to a gallon of water that you simply have to do and you can use that as a cleaning fluid as well. So those are simple things that we can get. I think we did see in the early parts of the, the, the whole pandemic that a lot of things were missing off of the shelves in our stores. They're coming back now. But bleach is one of those things that are fairly easy to get. And many people already have that in their households. And the other thing I would just like to add is that please don't fall into prey that, you know, there's these um, COVID-19 chemicals that are going to cure everything. Uh, please don't fall for those scams. Your local grocery store, your local um, Walgreens, CVS, all those stores, they all carry the bleach and the, the things that you need. So please don't. We've heard of so many seniors being scammed. Please be careful about that especially. Thank you, Cindy, for that last comment. I just want to add to that, folks, there are no magic or silver bullets here. It's a combination of social distancing, personal hygiene, washing your hands, not touching your face, just like our parents have all taught us and your parents and, and cleaning your services. So if, you have, if, you're being, if you're being solicited and you're not sure about what, uh, uh, what is being asked, you call to be on one of the council on aging and we'll make sure we'll follow up on that. But do not fall. Thank you, Cindy, for any scams. Next, we're going to call on Ann Kamara to ask a question live. Welcome, Ann. Ann, can you hear us? We're working on it, folks. Ann, I think you might be muted. Can you hear me now? Yeah, Ann, how are you? Oh, hi, I'm good. How are you? Okay, thanks for calling. I just want to say I, I think you're doing a great, great job Thank with you. all of this. I, I, I feel safe. Good. Um, two things for seniors. Um, are we connected at all with um, community broadband or any kind of internet that people for people that cannot afford? internet i believe that rcn does have a program that okay. is available and if you contact my office and uh, you, you and i've talked a couple of times i think if you call call me i can get okay. you a number 
Yeah, and if, and I, we'll... if I have um, tablets that we can get, that Mass Senior Action can give seniors, would that go through your department also? That would be great. Okay. Be great. And last question is, um, uh, people that are need food stamps and don't, uh, you know, applications are hard to. This we're on a Mass Senior Action uh, meeting today, and these are the three things we talked about. So is that also your department? We actually have a, a food stamp kiosk in our office. So we're okay. able to handle all of that immediately. There's no other place that they have to go. We're, we're right there, we have it. It's something we installed just before this whole thing happened. So we can handle awesome. that very quickly. Okay, that's all I have to ask. Thank you. And I'll be in take care of yourself, Ann, and thank you. You too, you here. too, bye-bye. Uh, now, folks, I'm actually honored to call on uh, the city council president, the president from Ward 1, who, along with so many councils, have been at the forefront assisting all of us, working together locally and region to help protect all of us, Matt McLaughlin. Welcome, Mr. President. Hi, can you hear me now? Uh, I think you are. I can't hear you now, but it looks like you can all hear me. Yeah, uh, thank you. Enough. Sorry about that. There we go. Uh, yeah, I just want to chime in real quick. Thank you for giving me the time, and thank you to all the city staff for all the hard work that we're all doing. Um, you know, I have four senior homes in my ward, and unfortunately I can't physically visit these places because of uh, the, co the quarantine in some cases or uh, restricting access, but I'm very grateful to have Cindy and Doug and uh, you, Mr. Mayor, uh, there to make sure that uh, people are being taken care of. Um, sit, uh, there are several other counselors in attendance. Unfortunately, I can't uh, see them, but I just want to acknowledge that they're all here. And we've all been working with Cindy to help seniors uh, with food drop-offs and different things like that. And I was wondering if Cindy or Doug could just uh, mention some volunteer opportunities, if there's anybody out there who's interested in pitching in. Sure. We're doing the new card drive. That would be great. The other thing, cards and notes for seniors that are shut in and medically um, restricted to just one room. Um, it's also good for folks that are being quarantined. Also, still continue with the brown bag and mask. If there's anybody in your ward, uh, we are in the process of doing it now. We have them all at 167 Holland. So if there's seniors in your um, areas or wards rather that you know can't get out, we're happy to help have you help us with that, with the delivery. Thanks, Cindy. I just want to add one other thing for a lot of our seniors that are out there um, or people who are worried about our seniors. Pick up the phone and call a couple of them. Call your mom, call your dad, call your aunts, your uncles. Check in with uh, everybody. And then even amongst us, let's check in with each other as well. This is a stressful time for all of us. And we know that staying home can be a challenge for people because we are social people. So please pick up the phone and give them a call um, and, and be able to have that conversation. If you have FaceTime or Duo or a variety of other uh, ways that you can talk to people, please think about doing that. I know several people who used um, Zoom meetings for Mother's Day this past uh, weekend as well. And that's one way that you can keep in touch and still see their faces and be able to do it. I know it's not the same as being face to face, but it's always good to see somebody's face and, and give a smile and call them and put smiles on their face. And I wanna reiterate what Cindy said is, with the new card program that we have going on, designing a card, sending a card, letting people know that you're caring about them, even if somebody you don't know about, knowing that somebody cares about you and is taking the time to do that is really important. So thank you, Cindy, for doing that. I think it's a great opportunity to do it. Thanks, Doug. Uh, thanks, uh, Councilor McLaughlin, Mr. President. Uh, we have other, and we're blessed to have a lot of city councils on this call. And can I ask the city councils, can you just send us uh, a heads up in the Q&A function so we know you're here and I can call on you. But I do wanna recognize, uh, before I do that, the question about internet, Folks, you can call 311 or visit the city's websites, uh, www.summerbowlma.gov slash coronavirus. There is information about uh, discounted or free internet um, access. Again, or call 311 or the council on aging. I do want to recognize our newest member of the city council. As you know, if you don't know, Stephanie Hirsch and her family moved out to Wisconsin. She had to step down to care for her family. And we are 
now blessed to have serving us in this community. She's fantastic. She, the new counsel at large, Ms. Kristen Strezzo. Counsel, <laughs> thank you. Thank you for having me and for all the, the great work you've, you've been doing. Uh, so my question is, I've heard that early on in the COVID shutdown, some seniors have had troubles getting to essential toiletries such as hand soap, hand sanitizer, and toilet paper. What is the Council on Aging in the city system for getting essential toiletries to seniors, especially if the building um, is quarantined? If I may, um, we did have one building that was quarantined and we were able to support whatever needs they had. We were on top of it. If they called us the night before or sometimes even that day, we were able to deliver that. Uh, we were working with another member uh, of the community who was collecting toiletries and we were connected up with her and she also gave us a lot of things that we were able to send out to folks. So any request we have, we have been able to fulfill it. Yeah, let me add that uh, even before we had a quarantine one building, right now there are other buildings who are virtually quarantined, self-quarantined, right. uh, because just to be extra vigilant, as we all know why, we've all read mm -hmm. and heard the terrible reports of how this virus has flashed through buildings of seniors and assisted living facilities and veterans homes. Uh, and we had great collaboration and compliance from our privately and publicly run senior facilities and veterans facilities. So in advance of even having to quarantine that building, Cindy and Doug and their teams have been doing outreach to those facilities, making sure they're abiding by advanced protocols and mandates and checking in to see what supplies or whatever thing they need from PPE to these other essentials as well. We were also distributing, um, helping them get their prescriptions as well. Okay, and so they would call 311 if that were an issue ongoing? Sure, 311, Council on Aging, uh, we'll, we'll, if they call 311, we'll direct them. Okay, thank you very much. All right, thank you, Counselor. Um, I'm now gonna, uh, we had an online a question through the Q&A chat. This is a pretty straightforward one. How can I make sure from an anonymous attendee, whoever you are, thank you for the question. How can I make sure that my parents are on the list to receive masks? Uh, Cindy, pretty mm -hmm. straightforward, you wanna answer that? Absolutely. All you're going to do is call us at 625-6600, uh, extension 2300. It's a live person answering the phone, just like 311, and we will get them on the, on the list that quickly. Thank you for that question. This question was sent in by Constant, Constance Bernie. A Constance, thank you for the question, and I'm going to read it. Of the tests that have been done in, in the city, what percentage has tested positive and how many of those are seniors? Are you right now, as of this forum, still recommending seniors stay at home as much as possible? Well, let me answer the last part of that one first and go to the rest and pass it to Doug. Yes, we are recommending strong advisors seniors to stay at home. That's what I'm telling my mother. I miss my mother daily. I run down to the sidewalk, she sees me, and she's not to leave her house otherwise, uh, other than we make sure she said gets to my sisters up, uh, up the street and they've all been quarantined, sort of self-isolated. We will help you get the supplies you need. Why is that the case? Because we know people 60 or over are susceptible, more susceptible uh, to being, uh, you know, to this disease and have been infected by it. And once they get it, uh, a greater risk of having um, more negative consequences and outcomes from that. We know that death rates are higher among seniors than those with underlying uh, issues or chronic illnesses. Um, so we strongly advise you stay home. Even as sectors of our economy open up, we will send those reminders out to you. In terms of um, the positivity or what percentage of our population is tested positive, overall, our positivity rate is around 5%, maybe slightly less. And again, remember that shot I showed you at the beginning, that speaks to the positivity rate. And that's only the people that have been tested. So we really, and so the more testing that we see happening, we see that rate decreasing, but that does not fully or accurately depict how many people are carrying the virus, but still important. Uh, information. Doug, do you want to add to that? I, I didn't answer the part of how many seniors. I don't know if I have that breakdown. Yeah, so we are we don't have the breakdown of the seniors and we can certainly try and pull some of that information. Um, so some clarity around that. A lot of the data that we have uh, right now is uh, the data that is now in the new testing facility up with CHA. Um, we don't have how many have been tested outside in the whole general population because a lot of those tests were done in different ways. Um, we do have, have, as the mayor said, about a four to five percent uh, positivity rate within the tests that we've been talking about up at 
the, the tent here at Vines CHA Hospital. Um, of those, the majority of the positive tests are showing up in the 02145 neighborhood um, with about 60% of the, the positive rates down there. Um, in the 02144 um, of the positivities, there's about 15% of them. And in the 02143, uh, 02143 zip code, um, we have about 23% of our positives that are in that area. So we see that it is spread throughout the community and that's an important thing to understand. So that's why we really wanna make sure everybody does get tested so that we can see how that spread is actually happening within our community. Uh, thanks, Doug. And again, thank you, Constance, uh, for that question. I do want to recognize uh, the city councilor from uh, Wood 7. Uh, Ms. Katiana Ballantyne is joining us. Thank you, councilor. And I want to give her an opportunity to speak. Good evening. Thank you, everybody. Um, I just want to say thank you for all you're doing, specifically, you know, Cindy Hickey and the Council on Aging. Um, uh, I, I hear more comments of thank you. Um, and how you've reached out uh, to our community of seniors. And I, I think it's really important that uh, you're aware that it's well respected. I will say um, I have my 89 year old dad who lives with me. I, the newsletters he likes, he was trying to find the words in the, 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 uh, the hidden words in the, in the puzzle. And uh, I, I just little things like that and connecting the pictures with the names those kinds of paper mail um, are you know, really important. I'm so glad to hear about the card writing initiative. Um, so I will certainly be sure to spread that uh, in my networks, but thank you um, for suggesting what many of us might think are little things, but really mean a lot to, to our uh, senior population, neighbors, friends who, who live in our community. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, Council, and thank you to all the counselors for uh, folks without their support. I mean, they've stepped up not just to help us policy or funding, they've been there on the front lines with all of us. I can't thank you enough, Council Valentine, the entire city council and school committee. Um, I, I think it's an important point that was just made, folks, that, you know, obviously the, the COVID-19 crisis has turned our lives and way of life upside down. It's also, an incredible amount of emotional and social um, uh, mental distress on all of us uh, because of the uh, isolation and, and the uncertainty. So it's an important time, especially with our seniors and others, to check in one another in any way we can support people emotionally and spiritually and embrace one another. It's going to help us all get through this. Uh, and we need to make sure that not only we protect ourselves from, you know, having the virus transmitted to us, but we need to make sure our mental and emotional health is, is stable as we move forward. Um, so thank you for those comments, counselor. Cindy, you work. There's a few um, on the q and I'm gonna read off, because they're, they're uh, all the same um, spirit. To Cindy Hickey, this is from Joe Lynch, uh, one of our favorites. You and your staff are doing a terrific job. Let us know what we can do to assist your efforts to help you in the seniors of this city. Joe Lynch from Somerville Media Center, the president and board of directors. Thank you, Joe, for that comment. No, no, Cindy, do you want to, anything you want to say to Joe? Thank you, Joe. Just keep plugging us out there and letting people know we're here. We're working as hard as we can for as many of the seniors. And, and one quick brief thing about the card letter writing is that they grew up with letters. This is their, this is their era. So to them, a card and a note means so much. So thank you, um, Councilor Valentine. And I'll make sure I get a fly it to all the counselors to get that out there. Thank you. And this next one, it came in the Q&A function uh, from Allison. Thank you for all that you're doing. What can we do to help? What do you need from us? Thank you, Allison. That's the type of outreach that's really inspired us. People want to help out. Uh, there's a bunch of things you can do. Uh, if you want to volunteer, just call 311. We can direct to that. If you can make a donation to the Somerville Cares Fund, there's a link to that on the city of Somerville's website, uh, www.somervillema.gov slash coronavirus. Uh, your support is really critical. Uh, we really appreciate it. Um, also, uh, where can we give money to help the hungry in town? Uh, I would ask to the, the to the, some of the coronavirus relief fund, um, the Somerville Cares Fund, as I just mentioned, www.somervillema.gov slash coronavirus. This is from Dana Robert. Thank you, Dana, for offering that. We really appreciate that. And it's one of the best ways you can help really those in the most dire need. 
Um, so now we're going to go back to the questions that were submitted before the meeting. This is from Pauline regarding accessibility. Cindy, I think I'm going to have you take a shot at this. If Meals on Wheels is considered essential, why can't elder services be considered essential as well? I'm blind and cannot read. Clean and perform other daily activities without this service coming to me. Thank you, Pauline. It's an excellent question, uh, Cindy. And thank you, Pauline. Um, we do understand this. Um, it, we struggled as a team to decide whether or not to stop some of these programs. But because there's so many different people, for instance, one particular building doesn't have one home health care worker or one VNA nurse. They have multiple. So that means there's, you know, 20, 30 people a day walking in and out from house to house to apartment to apartments. And once we had the first building quarantine, we felt that for your safety, we needed to do this. And there will come a time, and hopefully in the very near future, future that we're able to do the new norm and there'll be new ways for them to come in in a safe environment but for right now we feel this is safe and Pauline I, I would love for you to call me anytime you need anything and I will help you as much as I possibly can. Thanks Cindy and thanks Pauline. We have two questions one from the Q&A and one from those submitted in advance around testing uh, and vaccine so I'm going to ask them back to back first. Uh, and accessibility questions, and I don't have a name, but whoever offered this question, thank you very much. Testing location would require me to take two buses to get there. Are there plans to make tests more accessible? Doug, you want to take a shot at this, and then I can uh, uh, jump in? Sure, yes. We're actually evaluating trying to, to uh, bring the testing out to the communities a little bit more. Um, we are working closely with CHA to really identify either a second location or one of the things that we've been talking about even more so now is looking at a mobile location. They can go to multiple sites um, so that we can actually be uh, where people are at rather than to have, have people coming to us. How can we make it a move, mobile site that'll bring it closer to individuals in the communities itself? So look for that over the next week or so and hopefully we'll be able to announce where that's gonna be. Yeah, but I would say, and Cindy, you can add to this, if you want to get to a test site and you're having transportation issues, you can call 311 to the Council on Aging. Cindy, am I correct? We can make arrangements for them. Absolutely. We so will make it happen. Whoever submitted this, don't let that challenge uh, dissuade you from going. Call us. We'll, we will work with you. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, Alan Biggin um, submitted a question around vaccines, similar to this, but when a vaccine, it, it's about accessibility and access. When a vaccine becomes available, will seniors be prioritized to receive it? Well, Doug, I'll let you chime in, but first, Alan, thanks for the question. Second, I hope you're holding up well as well as everyone else. We pray a vaccine comes soon and, you know, one, every, it should be available to everyone. Two, no one should have to pay for it. Uh, and we should be targeting our most vulnerable populations first. Doug, do you want to add to that? Absolutely. We are, we are putting a priority on to our seniors because we know that often those are their most vulnerable for this, so absolutely we'll, we'll do that. In fact, my staff right now, we're also starting to plan for the fall and looking at the availabilities of what are the flu vaccines that are out there. And we'll look, work very closely with Cindy and her staff to make sure that we put a plan together um, that does put a priority for our seniors. Thanks, I have another question, to, and thank you, Alan, I submitted uh, in advance to the person did not give you a name, but thank you for offering this question. And it is, it is extremely difficult these days to get quarters to do laundry with very un, uh, and, a, and very unsanitary to use quarters anyway. Can the mayor's office initiate a change citywide in public elderly and disabled buildings from coin up to stored value card laundry machines or at least uh, change machines? Great question. Cindy, do you want to try to respond to that? Absolutely. The mayor and I have had a conversation about this and he has urged me to contact the city, the buildings. We do have a couple buildings in the city that are already operated by a, a laundry card. I think it should have it should be that way all the time, everywhere. And it is my mission tomorrow morning to start on this program. Thank you, Cindy. And this is a great question. And as soon as we saw it, we're, uh, we, we jumped all over it. It is one of those practical things as we think about how can we ensure our safe social distancing and proper sanitation and hygiene uh, without making these types of changes. And these are the type of changes that shouldn't be difficult to make. So thank you for that question and suggestion and we're on it, more to come. Um, there was a, um, another question that came in the Q&A chat, if I'm reading correctly, G Small, and I'm sorry if I'm not pronouncing it correctly, any talk about transportation and socially distancing as 
we start to reopen. By the way, the T has been doing a great job during the pandemic. Uh, first, uh, thank you. I'll relay that message to the, uh, the higher ups and the representatives of the MBTA. Yes, there is conversation around transportation, uh, both locally and I also chair the Metropolitan Mayor's Coalition, which is the uh, coalition of 50, 15 cities and towns in the inner core of the Boston region, as well as larger coalitions. I will be presenting tomorrow with uh, one of my colleagues, the Mayor of Salem, and others to the reopening advisory task force. The question around transportation uh, and equity and so forth will be at the forefront. So stay tuned. This is being evaluated locally and regionally and at the higher levels. And uh, I'll pass your comment up about your satisfaction with cleanliness of the tea. Thank you very much for that question. Um, the next question uh, around testing was sent in in advance. Uh, does, it says on data, does the city plan to do any testing for antibodies as Brookline is doing to see if there might be a possibility of some immunity? So we answered a little bit of this before, but Doug, I'll let you add to this. I thank you for the question. Uh, in short, yes, and we are doing some and hopefully to expand, but Doug, why don't you add to it? Sure, yes, it's something that we're evaluating and trying to look at this. I think one thing to keep in mind when we do talk about the antibody test um, is that Right now, there have been no antibody tests that have been FDA approved. There are many that are in development, and we hope to be part of that process within the development so that we can be a pilot site within the, the, the Commonwealth so that we can move that forward to really understand how the antibody tests are gonna be working so that we can move it forward. So it's something that we're exploring. I encourage people and remind people again, what Cindy and the mayor both mentioned earlier, as well as there is some, uh, false tests that are being done out there. So please be cautious of any of that. We are all very nervous and, and afraid about this virus. I understand that. And we're looking for ways that we can protect ourselves. But please make sure that you're going through a reputable area when you're talking about testing so that you're not um, taken advantage of. And that is for anybody in our community. It, it's anybody, my parents, me, my kids, any of them, I think it's important to remember that. We need to make sure that we are going with a credible organization um, when we're talking about doing any of these testings. But look for that as we move forward in the, in, in the next coming of weeks. And along those lines, a question from Don and Ginny about antibody tests. Antibody tests are not free in Somerville, correct? And none of the labs in Somerville are giving FDA approved antibody tests. Um, thank you, uh, Don and Ginny, for the question. Doug, did you want to add first? And I can add in. No, I think that, that she's very right. They are not free um, right now. I don't know any of them that are doing it. But again, let me reiterate that the FDA has not approved any of the any uh, antibody tests as of yet. We are hoping that we can be part of the, the process of that in a pilot program so that we can do that, so that it is um, a way to actually do the testing so that we can be an example for other um, municipalities and others across the U.S. Mayor, I think you're still on mute. Uh, thank you. I so said, Don and Jenny, we are working uh, with other partners to um, implement or distribute a platform of testing, including antibody tests. Again, antibody tests on their own are not um, good baseline indicator, nor are viral tests on their own. We need a combination of both, and not just in some of them, but regionally across the Commonwealth and the country to understand you know, how the pandemic is changing. Um, so thank you for that question. There's a lot more to come on this and the, the platform we're seeking to deliver would be free uh, to folks when it does happen. So stay tuned uh, for that. Um, here's a question from an anonymous uh, attendee, but thank you for the question. And it, if someone is homebound, like my father, can they be tested for COVID-19 or the antibody test? Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, Cindy and Doug, do you wanna give a shot to that, Doug? Sure. Um, if somebody is homebound, please give us a call and we will, we will figure out a way to get somebody tested. Um, in fact, there are several of our residents who don't have access uh, or not mobile enough to be able to get to a testing site. And, and we will work with you to try and get somebody in there because we know that there's people out there who have a lot of um, caretakers that are coming into their home and they're fearful of some of that. And we understand that. So we want to make sure that Again, this test is open to everybody. So please just give 311 a call or you can call our office at the health department and we will be able to help set that up for you. And thank you for that question. Uh, going back to a couple of questions that were submitted in advance, this one also on accessibility. And whoever offered this question, thank you. Can I wear a plastic face shield instead of a face mask? 
I can't wear a face mask due to skin condition. I've tried every kind of mask, scarf, et cetera, and I had the same problem. The short answer is yes. Uh, you can wear, uh, uh, cloth material is very effective, um, and those post-surgical masks. And, but the point is, as long as your nose and mouth is covered, and we understand that some people may have underlying conditions where this is difficult, and we're taking that into consideration. So if you're making a good faith effort, you're not going to get a ticket. You're not going to be fine. That's all we ask. It's only for those people who are physically able and are willfully not compliant. Well, then they'll be susceptible to the fine. But I do want to thank you and everyone in the city. The compliance has been fantastic. Not perfect, but really good. And that's going to go a long way in helping us in our efforts to, again, interrupt the transmission of the virus from one person to another. But yes, you can use that as long as your mouth and nose are covered. If your question is to say, I have an underlying condition, and there shouldn't be a problem at all. Thank you um, for that question. The next question comes in the Q&A chat. It's from Elaine Corey. Uh, good evening, Elaine, and thank you for this question and comment. I'm going to read it off. Thank you for this meeting. This pandemic and its potentially disastrous consequences for older adults has brought out the best in some of all that all, has also highlighted deficiencies in the safety net. It is very likely that there will be long-term effects on our lives, at least until a vaccine is found. Four months ago, Massachusetts Senior Action Council wrote to point out that some vision, the city's long-term plan had completely omitted anything about seniors. Would you please instruct the planning department and other appropriate departments to conduct in-depth needs assessments of the needs of seniors in Somerville? They should include seniors in NGOs, uh, non, that's non-governmental organizations that serve seniors to rewrite some vision so that plans are made in every section of the overall plan, support seniors. Uh, thank you, Elaine, I couldn't agree more. This is a city we want, we strive to serve everyone to achieve it, to be an exceptional place to live, work, play, raise a family for all, and to age in place and leave your life in dignity. I will do so. Cindy, did you want to add to that? Yes, in the Summer Vision 2020, we also have been, I mean, uh, 2040, sorry, there's been a lot of interaction with us and uh, comments, and we're working on some um, feedback from the community. So you'll see a lot more of that coming up for the 2040. Thank you, and thank you, Elaine, for that question. Back to those uh, questions that were submitted in advance. Is free testing also available for those who work in Somerville? An example given, grocery workers. Right now, the testing in partnership with the Cambridge Health Alliance is available to anyone who is a Somerville resident. Our goal, however, is to begin, begin expanding that to our workforce, those who work in the city and the schools, and for those who work uh, in the front lines, essential workers like grocery store workers and others. Those plans are evolving. Uh, our efforts have also been closely tied to the availability of testing supply. The kits themselves, the supplies that support the kits, like the swabs for the viral testing, the vials that have to be contained, the, the, the culture, the test culture, and the reagents. So uh, we have a plan in place to expand that, not just in Somerville, uh, but with the region and the Cambridge Hospital, Cambridge Hospital Line safety net. Uh, and, but part of our plan, and we had conversations I did with the uh, healthcare uh, partner is to uh, expand the plan to those essential workers. So thank you for the question. The short answer is that plan uh, is developing and stay tuned uh, for more updates. Along those lines, I'm gonna ask another question that was submitted in advance. How often will residents be able to get tested? Doug, why don't you give a shot at this? Sure, that's a great question. Thank you, I'm not sure who asked that question, but. I think there's a couple things to keep in mind. We do want everybody to have that opportunity to be tested. I think the way to think about this is that the test that we're doing is actually for the virus, and it's a great baseline for an individual. So you can be tested today, and that's great. You'll know where it is. You'll get results with, uh, in about five days, sometime sooner. Um, and then that is your baseline. So I would wait to get tested again until if you started to feel symptoms, signs, or symptoms. And then you'll want to go in and get tested again if that's the if, if that's the challenge for you, because again we we know that there's limited amount of tests that we that, that and access to those tests because it does take time to gear them up and to do all that. We do have a plan to have many many more tests so that we're not worried about running out of tests. But we also want to make sure that it's the opportunity for everybody to get tested. So if you get tested today, wait. And, and use that as your baseline. And if you start to get any of those signs or symptoms, whether that's a fever, whether those are severe headaches, or if you're losing your sense of smell and taste, then you wanna go in and try to and get tested again. So again, use this as your baseline 
and then wait to be tested if you start to have any of those signs or symptoms. Thanks, Doug. The next question that came in through the Q&A is from Joshua Aviv. Thank you, Joshua, for the question. And it states, when can businesses have their employees return back to work? That's a good question. Um, as you, if you don't know, and I'm sure many of you do, Governor Baker announced uh, the reopening uh, advisory task force a couple of weeks ago. They will present all recommendations to the governor by May 18th. The first phase of reopening will be uh, May 18th. And, um, he will, and there'll be four phases and there'll be guidelines and measurements in terms of when each phase will occur and what sectors of the economy, for example, whether it be retail, manufacturing, entertainment, so forth, or recreation and so forth will be activated during those phases. So let me also, so stay tuned for that, but I wanna make a couple of things clear. Um, every expert we've heard regionally and nationally is advised to be slow and deliberate when reactivating parts of our economy. We have all suffered and people have died because of this pandemic. Our economy and any business owner and anybody who's lost their job, I, I am sorry for what you're going through. Uh, but that sacrifice shouldn't be thrown away by a rush to reopen. Any reopening should be guided by science and the experts. Um, so there's not a hard date yet, and it shouldn't be about a date, it should be about a plan, a plan that is bolstered by advanced levels of testing, viral testing, serology, contact tracing, and case tracking. That's what I'm fighting for as one local official. But as we begin, and we'll hear more on the 18th, there will be in phase one, that's the beginning of phase one, it appears, some sectors of the economy that open. And with every sector that opens, there'll be required guidelines for how you operate, for sanitation, for cleanliness, for social distancing, uh, for protective coverings, and the notifications you must post. So that's something we all have to prepare for as part of what we're referring to as the new normal. I will also want to make this clear, please. Um, as a city and town, we're a home rule state, I'll say, and in some of along with other communities, when the state dragged its feet on closing schools, we went ahead and did not wait because we knew it was too risky and lives would be lost. Finally, the state came along. When the state was slow to issue stay-at-home advisory or requirements, communities like Somerville across the region and Commonwealth acted. And if in this event, it was at the beginning we knew days mattered. Here, pace matters. We cannot rush to reopen because the consequences could be more people getting sick, dying, our economy being worse off because there's going to be a resurgence and it cannot be worse than what we're going through now. So if the governor issues any type of order or line for certain industries, that we believe based on the experts we're speaking with, the same experts who are advising the CDC and the World Health Organization, and in some cases the governor, I don't agree with, we reserve our right to not activate that sector. So if the governor says all restaurants are open on the 18th, I will tell you uh, for, for in-seating or on-premise dining, I will tell you that will not occur in some of them. We will be guided by expertise, and by the science, and with the goal of making sure more people don't get sick and die. So stay tuned. Uh, we understand there's an urge to get back to our way of life as it was. That's not going to be the case right away, folks. We're going to be living with this virus for a long time. We understand that people want to get businesses going and build up our economy. Nobody wants that more than me. Uh, our small businesses and our local businesses are really the foundation of our local economy. So I mean, appreciate and thank you for your patience and understanding. And we'll see what the governor's plan is, and then we'll hear the city's announcement based on after we're done analyzing that plan. Uh, on that, another note on the Q&A function, is there a set and well-defined protocol for how often grocery and large retail store employees are tested? Uh, Doug, you can add, but in short, to be developed uh, as we try to expand testing. There really, in the frustrating part, folks, have been, there is no plan around testing. We've had to fight and scrap. We, the, the Commonwealth, understandably, is trying to fight to do more testing. And they've been focused, obviously, around senior buildings and veterans' homes where they've been. We've all heard those terrible reports, what happened in those buildings. But we're focused here in our vulnerable populations, as well as those on the front lines, whether they're first responders or people working to provide essential services like grocery store or, large, or, or these types of employees. So as we expand our testing efforts here in Somerville, as I mentioned earlier, we will work to um, give access to those employees for testing. That plan is being developed. And uh, whoever this uh, person is who sent this in, thank you very much. Um, going back to the question sent in advance, um, this is a medical question from Helen Corrigan. Helen, it's great to hear from you. I hope you're doing fine, uh, and thank you for the question. 
Ellen says, I have no symptoms and self-quarantined for 14 days. Since then, I've only gone shopping with a mask three times. I take a walk around my neighborhood, again, with a mask most days. Should I be tested for the virus? Doug, you want to give a shot at this, Helen? Sure. I think this goes back to what we've already talked a little bit about. Go get tested. Absolutely. I think there's an opportunity for you to be tested because we are trying to get others to test. And this will give you a baseline and some reassurance of where you are with the virus, whether or not you've had it today. And if not, use that as your baseline. And then if you start to have any signs or symptoms, you, you know, you'll, you'll be able to go get tested again. I want to remind people, though, that we still have to keep all of our public health practices in place. Um, just because you're tested and it comes back negative doesn't mean you get to give everything up. We still need to continue all the public health practices that we have in place. And that includes washing your hands with the soap and water that we talked about earlier. It's that social distancing. It's wearing your face, uh, the, the face coverings when it's appropriate to wear those. And it's also limiting how many people we have around us. Um, don't go to a party knowing, oh, I know everybody and, and that's okay. I can go over there and have that party because I know everybody's negative. We don't know that for sure. So please continue to follow all those, those practices that we have been talking about since February. We need to do that. We've been doing an excellent job with that in Somerville. Let's continue those practices so that we can continue to slow this virus and we can get back to everybody being out and enjoying every, everyone. Okay, Doug, another question from Jerry Kaplan, uh, similar to that, Helen's, but I'm gonna ask it anyway, submit in advance. Thank you, Jerry, for the question. It's on medical one. Hello, I'm a Somerville senior. I probably can't attend the virtual town hall tomorrow. I live alone. I have two questions, so he may not be on. So Jerry, if you're listening, thank you. If not, we'll send a shout out to you anyhow. Do you recommend that I be te tested? I have no symptoms and do not believe I've been exposed. If I am tested and if the results are negative, what does that imply about my risk? And if the results are positive, what should I do? Um, why don't you uh, take that one, Doug? I think you answered part of it already for Helen's question. Cool. I think I've already answered the first part about that. Should I get tested? You know, one thing to keep in mind, is it going to make you feel better as well, knowing, the, knowing your test results? That's going to help a lot. Go get tested. I think that's an important piece of that. I think the second question is, what happens if I test positive? When somebody does test positive, we will do the follow-up with you. We'll be calling you as the health department. We'll follow up with you and make sure that you have all the, the services that you need. One of the staff, one of our dedicated nursing staff will give you a call check in with you, we'll be able to check in with you um, on a daily basis if that's what you need. If you only need to be checked in every once in a while, we can do that as well. Um, but we wanna make sure that you're gonna stay healthy and that you're gonna get through this virus itself. And we're gonna see you at the other end. When we need to, we're gonna make our referrals out. That could be over to Cindy to help us um, with you. If, if you're a senior and you have some special services, again, Cindy and her team have been stepping up to the plate to really help us. Uh, make sure that seniors have access to the services that they need. If you need additional services, we'll get you and connected with all of those things. It is about referral. It's going to be to take care, care of everyone. And that's why we're here to make sure that we can help facilitate that for you. And the second part of this question is I usually pay to have my apartment cleaned, but to avoid risk, I've been trying to clean it myself, which I find difficult. Do you recommend that I have someone come to my apartment to clean it? I'll, I'll take that. So yes, we understand that these are difficult times and the dust bunny is still going to you know who, where that person has been and how many other houses they have cleaned. So it really is important for you to be able to um, is do as, as much as you can. We understand sometimes it's very difficult, but there will be a time when this is over that you'll be able to have some guidelines on how to get people back into your homes. And that's when I would recommend somebody coming in. Thanks, and the last medical question on, uh, on, on this sheet, these are the people submitted beforehand, and then I'll get to the ones in the Q&A. Uh, it's from Laura Zoll. Laura, thank you for the question. As a senior with underlying conditions, am I more susceptible to getting the virus or more susceptible to getting a worse case of the virus and or spreading it to others? Um, that's a pretty short answer. Doug, you want to give a quick answer on that? And I'll ask the second one. Sure. Yes. Yeah. You know, we're all being, we're all, we're all at risk of getting the virus. Um, I think what's important to know is as our, as we get older and we have underlying conditions, if we get that virus inside of our system, we're going to have a much harder time uh, fighting that virus. So it is much more difficult. That's why we want to keep everybody from getting that virus, especially if you have some underlying conditions. The other one is I have blood pressure, and along the lines, her second part is I have blood pressure that is very well managed with medication. 
Does that still make me more susceptible to the virus? Anytime that we have any of those underlying conditions, there's a <laughs> risk for that. So yes, you would still be a little bit more at risk than somebody who may not have any kind of underlying conditions. And thank you, Lauren, to all those who submitted their questions in advance of the meeting. We have some more on the Q&A before we end tonight. I'm going to answer them in a rapid way if I can. Uh, when I, from Joshua Aviv, again, uh, when can a small business, 15 to 20 people, does not offer a service to public, have employees return to office? Uh, Joshua, that's going to be determined, one, by the reopening phases uh, and guidelines that will be issued by the Commonwealth and the governor, but also and the city of Somerville evaluate what those businesses, how they're categorized uh, and what our experts are telling us. So stay tuned and more will be released on starting on May 18th and we'll give updates as we receive them. From Claudia P, thank you so much for all the work you were doing. I entered a late, late into the virtual town hall. When will the city of Somerville reopen, meaning business that are currently closed, places of worship? Thank you, Claudia, for the question. As I mentioned, uh, the governor will be given um, outlining uh, where in his four phases, different sectors of the economy and our way of life, like businesses, recreation opportunities, houses of worship can open. But I also call, uh, remind, as I just stated, that still uh, uh, needs to comply with local orders as well. So we're working and giving input to the Commonwealth so that we're uniform and consistent about what's released. What we don't want to have is a set of rules in one community and a set of rules in the other, but for some of all, I reserve my right, my responsibility to all of you that if something in our minds, based on what our experts are informing us of, is too risky and dangerous, we will not allow those operations to open, but more to come on that. Thank you, Claudia, for that question. From Chris Lindgren, seniors may have, may be undertaking childcare responsibilities for their families of parents who must work at their workplaces. Any comments on childcare immediate actions besides those for first responders, the next wave of workers to relieve seniors uh, of that responsibility? Doug, do you have any comments? I know this is a big issue and it's being discussed more intensely, Chris, at the Commonwealth and regional level, and we're hearing the same concerns. So more to come from that. Doug, did you have anything? I think that's a perfect answer because we are exploring that because we do understand that and we know that the risks um, that we don't want to bring any, we don't want to increase anybody's risk. So we are exploring what options might be out there. And we have the uh, Summer Promise team that are looking into that and looking at some of that along with the, the school district to talk about child care that's available. Thanks for that, Chris. Uh, from an anonymous attendee, are there enough tests available now? Initially, there were only 3,500. I don't want to get tested yet as others uh, are more vulnerable. The 3,500 you heard about was, uh, was tests we got to help expand our testing efforts from the Cambridge Health Alliance out to the general public. When we got that 3,500, uh, we got an additional 3,000 on top of that from a private vendor. And last week, we got 20,000 swabs. There's enough to expand the testing. So if you want to get tested, you don't have to be a Cambridge Health Alliance patient or client. You, don't, you just have to live in Somerville, and you just call the, hotline, the, the number. Uh, if you don't have the number, you can call 311. Uh, the Council on Aging will direct you. Set up an appointment and go get tested. Uh, we appreciate your concern, but there's enough to test everyone who needs it on that front. And we're pacing the testing so that everyone who needs it can get it. Um, I am uh, from another anonymous attendee. Antibody tests are not free and some of them, correct? Um, we already answered this question. Uh, let me, I'm sorry, a couple more tests here before we head off. Uh, if you get tested and are negative, it's, uh, it's an aha moment. That said, as soon as you find out, you need to continue to be safe and social distance with a mask at all times. Will some of our residents have an opportunity to be tested for antibodies? Thank you so much for the Zoom forums. Jules Drake, thank you, Jules, for the question. Doug, I know we've kind of answered this already. Do you want to just chat in quickly for Jules? Well, I think that, yeah, we are, we've already answered a lot of those things. And really, it's, it's important to go out and get, to get the test whenever you're able to. We're learning more and more about antibody testing. We hope to be part of that and kind of move it forward. More to come, so keep your eyes open for some of that information. Thanks, Jules. An anonymous attendee asked, as the city starts to reopen, will you be including people with pre-existing conditions that put them in high-risk categories, but who are under 60 and protective measures put in place for seniors? We are examining all that in terms of city's operations. As I mentioned earlier, we have a focus on those who are 60 or over or have underlying conditions as we think about what the city's operations will be in the new normal, as well as that of the schools, so yes, more to come on that, and thank you for that question. Uh, from Wilfred, thank you, Will, for the question. Thank you for your leadership, as always. Do we know how many seniors are getting this value, these valuable updates now? Cindy, do you have a, 
update for Wilfred? Yeah, we're answering um, about, or speaking to about 2,000 people uh, through our main ear outlets and all that on a weekly basis. So we have updates going along and every time we get something, we pass it along immediately. Great, thanks. And I'm sorry, I was gonna go say, Council on Aging, get us on your media list, your Google list, whatever it is you wanna go on and we'll take care of it. Thanks, Cindy. From another anonymous person, and thank you for the question. Senior hours at stores have been very helpful. Will those hours continue and until when? Um, we'd like to see them continue and we continue to try to understand how we can better service our senior population in those stores with hours, or as a suggestion was made earlier for curbside and so forth and other delivery opportunities, we continue to examine that. And I suspect a lot of that will continue for the future as we have to operate and live in a new norm. So stay tuned and I expect that to be part of the guidelines hopefully where the governor thinks about reopening other sectors of the economy as well. Again, an anonymous person, thank you for this question. How, hi, you just mentioned we could get tested for baseline even if we are not showing symptoms. If I do that now and then I say I start having symptoms three or four weeks from now, can I get tested again for free? Doug, do you wanna answer that? Absolutely. Um, again, this is the idea behind this. So if you are starting to feel symptoms and signs and symptoms, Yes, you can go get tested, but also contact your primary care provider to let them know what's going on as well. Thank you, Doug. And Alan Bingham, I just want to say this. Uh, I think it applies. I thank you for the comments here, uh, but I'll apply it to the staff, to Cindy and all the workforce. Not a question. You don't need to reply. He says, but thank you. It's good to live in a sensible city, in a sensible state, when it seems that there is so much disarray nationally. We have this awful virus impact and everything. Our efforts are appreciated. Thank you, Alan. We appreciate you and everyone else. Folks, we're gonna overcome this, not by the mayor issuing any decree or any policy or any law. That's if we all do our part as individuals and meet our responsibility to make sure we look out for one another, we support each other, and we do our part to make sure we don't transmit the virus to another. That's how we're gonna get to the other side of this thing. Uh, and thank you, Alan. Uh, and Sumable has, you know, we sadly, we've lost almost 20 people. And then we lost a lot of people in the Commonwealth. And this could be a lot worse too. So all your efforts are appreciated. It's saving lives. And we will get to the other side of this thing together. Um, so I appreciate uh, those comments and, and everyone in the public, your efforts. Um, another, uh, we have two more, um, a couple more, and then we'll be done. We're wrapping up. So I thank everybody in advance. Another anonymous person. Will some of us consider passes for positive antibodies tests so that we might not have to wear masks uh, thank you. Uh, that was the question. And thank you for the question. Uh, we're not there yet on this. Uh, and I think any such measure should be done really on a larger level, either regionally across the Commonwealth. Um, it's not out of the realm of possibilities. But again, antibodies, remember, testing does not tell you, we don't know whether or not you're immune to this disease or how, how immune anybody is. Antibody tests are important in conjunction, working in tandem with the viral testing, the PBR. Uh, and as well as contact tracing and case tracking to understand how the virus is spreading. Um, so more on this will become, we wanna be guided by the science and experts before we entertain or advocate for any measures. But thank you for the question and we'll have more to come. Another um, question from an anonymous person. Um, I'm not a senior, but I have an autoimmune disorder. With the number of antibody tests not being FDA approved, how can you ensure the safety of those at risk. Doug, do you want to give a shot at this? And thank you for the question, whoever yeah, said that. Thank you for the question. I think that's an important question to, to answer. And, and we all have to take on some of those responsibilities as well. Um, and that's why we're doing these community efforts. That's why we're doing this community forum. We need to all do this as a community. We talked mm -hmm. about it earlier in protecting ourselves. That's an important piece of that. And why we're doing the, 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 the testing as well as what other efforts we can do to put forward so that we are able to come back out of this together as the mayor has been talking about. So what can you do for yourself to, with an autoimmune? Um, making sure that you're following all the same safe practices so that you don't get infected with yourself. We ought to take that responsibility on as well. So what are the things that you're doing in order to protect yourself from getting the virus in, uh, into you? And that includes staying at home. And I hate to say that a lot of times, but we need to do that right now. We still have to stay at home order in front of us. It's washing your hands frequently. It's following all those public health practices that we keep talking about over and over and over again. Mayor, I think you're still on mute. Thanks, Doug. These are gonna be the last two questions in Q&A. However, Ali C just asked a question about making a call by phone. Ali, dial star nine. 
uh, if you're calling in by phone, right, and we'll take your call live, and that at least will be the last question. So first, from an anonymous person, thank you for the question. Who states, thanks for all that some of them was doing. Great job. This Zoom meeting is being recorded. Where can I find the recording since I missed the first half? Thank you. Well, thank you. You can find it on the city's website. Uh, some of cable and on YouTube, it is being recorded. And if you're having trouble, just call 311 and we will direct you. From Lynn Ingersoll, what is the source of the $1 million Somerville Business Fund? Thank you for your question, Lynn. The source are community development block grant monies um, and program income. So within the community development block grant, block grant sphere, uh, we develop some income with some of our programs. We utilize that as well as other CDBG money to source the and found the uh, million dollar Somerville Business Fund. And thank you, uh, Lynn, for that question. Uh, we're gonna hold on, uh, Allie, have a question? Well, before Allie, we'll take that one of the question if she calls in, I wanna remind you all to sign up for the city alerts uh, uh, that go out um, three times a week. You can sign up uh, by going to somervillema.gov slash alerts. Again, that's somervillema.gov slash alerts, and again, you can always visit the website and to get your COVID-19 updates at sumablema.gov slash coronavirus. Um, and if we don't, if we get the call in the next couple of minutes, if not, Ali, send us an email or call 311, we'll get an answer to your question. I wanna thank Cindy, Doug, um, Adriana, and a big round of applause. I know we were down today, Kerry McSwain for being our you know, American Sign Language interpreter. Um, and uh, all of you, thank you for what you're doing to help us work together to overcome the COVID-19 crisis. I just heard from Allie, she got her answer to a question. Thanks, Allie. And uh, all of you who celebrated Mother's Day, had a good Mother's Day. Um, and we will be back in touch holding more of these town hall forums. Thank you for joining us tonight. I hope we did a good job for you all. Take care of yourself, all right? God bless, we'll get through this together. Have a good evening. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, Sarah Burns. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Mayor.